Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Christine Galeb and I'm the Senior Director of Programs at the ION. I am also thrilled because I have been asked to serve as the IdeaGen uh, Acceleration Summit Series Chair here. So for the Houston Galveston region, my role is to spotlight the talent, the leaders, the people who are doing the community building work that will create a world that is not just different, but better. So welcome all. We have some incredible people here on our panel today. Before I call the panel members up, I'd love to just take a moment and show you a little bit behind me. I am here in the ION building here in Houston, Texas, and the ION anchors a 16 acre innovation district. So we are focused here on several goals of accelerating innovation and connecting communities. And that fits very well with the sustainable change that we're creating, not just in Houston, not just in the Houston Galveston region, but in the spirit of IdeaGen being the glue that holds the globe together, um, we are accelerating change around the world. So I'd love to call up our panelists today to introduce themselves because today is not about me, it is about the panelists. So we'll start uh, first by going down to Galveston um, with Keith, who is uh, over at Vision Galveston. Keith, come on up to the virtual stage and tell us a little bit about yourself, your organization, and some of the change that you have been working on. Hi, thanks for having me, Christine. Really excited to be here today. I'm Keith Jacoby with Vision Galveston, and we are a community building nonprofit that connects the vision that we share for our island to the resources that make it happen. And we are rooted in inclusion and equity from the sense of our planning process began with inviting the entire uh, community and residents into the process. We spoke with over 8,500 individuals, which is about 15% of the population in Galveston. Um, so we're really excited to advance um, the agenda of the community members mm -hmm. forward. And that ranges from projects on uh, cost attainable and workforce housing to green space planning, using that as a walkable sustainable mode of transportation. Um, we're working on Incubate Galveston with Christine and her team at the ION on connecting the region to entrepreneurship opportunities around coastal resilience. And you know, lastly, really trying to pull in a community in action from the sense of allowing new leadership to form and helping those folks that don't traditionally have a voice in our civic process an opportunity to engage. So we're really excited to be with you today. I love that. And, and Keith has already set the foundation for our panel as one of building those voices up, amplifying the community voices. That's what we'll talk about a little later on. Let's stay in Galveston for a second and bring up to the stage Larry, who will talk a little bit about the academic scene and how one of the pillars of Galveston from the academic perspective is engaging in these projects to build inclusive and sustainable cities. Well, thanks very much, Christine. It was uh, quite a great introduction. Uh, I'm Larry Denner. I'm a professor of internal medicine at the University of Texas Medical Branch here on Galveston Island. Uh, a huge proponent of engaging the academic community with the local island community. And that's where uh, our work with Keith and Christine and other folks that you'll hear about uh, really really emanates from the institution uh, as a as an integral part of making this a better community and, and in total alignment with the sustainable development goals of, of really being resilient in the context of both health that we help try to export to the community but also the whole entrepreneurship and, and that mindset of of development and, and, and that spirit in trying to engage people in the community in their own lives and, you know, the betterment of all of us. I love that. And, and Larry has kind of layered on this notion of really what is a, a, an inclusive and sustainable city healthcare, right? That certainly plays 
a, a role in this conversation, coastal resilience, um, what it means to layer on not just the community work, but the academic work. And then for our third panelist, I'll call up David uh, to the virtual screen. And David uh, hails from Houston. So we've gone now from Galveston to Houston, covering this region very nicely to learn more about the work David is doing through his organization in Houston. David, come on up. Well, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm David Haynes. I'm the Chief Strategy and Innovation Officer here at Baker Ripley. Uh, Baker Ripley is one of the largest nonprofits in the country. Uh, providing health and human services. We're a 114 year old organization that prides ourselves on being able to touch a large group of people. We touch about 500,000 people um, in this region every year. Um, and what we like to say at Baker Ripley is we're big where it matters and we're small where it matters. So we're big in the, in the space of providing direct assistance, utility assistance, uh, rental assistance, uh, big programs like that that are federally operated workforce solutions, Head Start programs, and we're small where it matters. We have five community centers which we, we really think are the heart of our uh, our organization and they are able to provide things as small as Zuma classes for uh, seniors all the way through to small business, uh, uh, small business and entrepreneurship programs. So, um, yeah, we, we do a lot of stuff in a lot of different spaces, but our primary goals right now is really leaning in on social economic mobility and providing the neighbors with true access to resources that's going to allow them to build social, mental and physical capital. I love that. And David, I'm going to start with you kind of for our first entrance here into our questions for today. Social, economic, capital, mobility, all of these words that, that we all have used and we all kind of know what they mean. But could you maybe take us a, a layer deeper and talk a little bit about what Baker Ripley has been doing to link all those concepts to this notion, um, the sustainable development goal of sustainable and resilient cities, goal number 11. Um, how, do, how do all those themes correlate to your programs and then goal number 11? Absolutely. You know, it's a great question. So when I think about building resilience, it's really about giving people enough space, right? The word space means that they have a level of flexibility when a crisis hits or when circumstances on the horizon change. Uh, and for us, we look at it through three buckets. We look at it through a person's access to social capital, which is uh, that network, a cohort or an alumni association or organizations that allow them to leverage resources from other people. When I think about building space in that, we, we created five community centers to have a safe and secure uh, space for folk to come in and, and uh, communicate across a whole range of races, a whole range of age groups in a way that builds true community. When I think about physical capital, really that's providing people enough capital that allows them to, if they have uh, something that disrupts their monthly uh, circumstances, they have enough space that's been created by access to additional physical capital. So that's things like utility assistance. That's things like direct assistance and rental assistance. They need that extra support to allow them to continue on whatever aspirational journey they have. And when I think about the, the idea of building mental capital, that's having those types of credentials. That's having the type of, of uh, skills and training that allow you to transition if you are, are put out of a job. So it's it building capital and building space in those different spaces that I think builds a resilient individual, but also uh, allows for a resilient community. I could listen to that all day because I think you laid out such a clear roadmap and kind of pillars of really what it means to be resilient. And I'd love to now uh, tilt the spotlight to Keith because Vision Galveston under her leadership has kind of mimicked those pillars through its different programs, tackling um, issues such as uh, Build Galveston, Incubate Galveston, Green Galveston, and so much more. So Keith, I'd love to hear a little bit more from your perspective. Yeah, I mean, everything that we do is rooted in inclusion. As I mentioned, you know, when we began this process, we wanted to make sure that we included, you know, diversity and race, ethnicity, age, gender, um, and areas of the island and region. And so, you know, we, we were rooted there and all of the initiatives that we're focused on, you know, kind of revolve around making uh, the human and built environment inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. Um, for those of you that don't know, Galveston is a barrier island and we are sinking. So it's it's within our uh, 
we, we desperately have to innovate around those things and ensure um, sustainability for not only the land mass, but the population who resides here. And so our initiatives, you know, particularly around inclusion on if you work here, you should be able to live here. And we're very focused on that from a workforce housing perspective. We currently have a 65% commuter rate, which means 25,000 people drive onto our island every day and then they drive off. And so it's a huge initiative for the community and for Vision Galveston to provide opportunities for our workforce to continue to live here. The other in terms of built environment is really on our parks and green space opportunities. Um, we're really focused on building out demonstration projects that show 21st century climate ready parks. And we look to our you know, partners in Houston for guidance around that. There's been some really great work done there. And we want to pull those ideas from the region on down. And then our work together, Christine, with the ION is, you know, how do we include the entire entrepreneurship ecosystem in our work rather, you know, than just holding one or two partners um, in the fold, which is how we're working with Larry and University of Texas Medical Branch, um, Texas A&M Galveston, the, the local high schools and chamber and so on and so forth, looking to see how do we bring in, you know, a more inclusive group who doesn't typically have access to entrepreneurship and innovation um, resources. So we're really excited about that. And, and again, ultimately, we're rooted in engagement. We want to continue that engagement. When we look at our city leadership um, and leadership in general, it can oftentimes look one-sided. So we want to make sure that that conversation is shifting. And part of doing that is bringing those leaders who right now don't have a platform or, or a big enough opportunity to use their voice. We want to provide those opportunities. I love that because you've, you've mirrored kind of the framework model of engaging a broad and diverse group of stakeholders, because the the one or two problems that, that we're all trying to tackle, we've got to bring multiple stakeholders to the table to tackle them in new ways. And so I'd love to now turn it over to Larry. Can, can you weigh in a little bit, Larry, from where you sit as one of the partners in one of the university settings, thinking through how we engage kind of beyond the walls of the academy <laughs> or, or, or kind of the classroom. Oh, that's a, that's a trap. I think you just said for me, Christine. <laughs> I don't set traps. I, I, no, no, I no, no. I'm just joking. <laughs> it, it's, it's so true that, you know, traditionally academic institutions are kind of tend to get wholly into themselves. And that's really not our mission. Our mission is to be a public servants and to help people in the community and help people, you know, with, with healthcare, with their lives, improve their lives. But a lot of that requires really being out and, and being involved in our community. And like Keith said, I mean, it's just incredible how valuable and how important partnerships are with different kinds of people. You know, we have lots of academicians at the University of Texas Medical Branch. We don't need more people that think like that. We need people that think about problems in the community and how to improve our resiliency as a, as, as a bigger community. And that's where I think um, it, it, we just can't understate the value of partnerships. And and, and ours with Keith and ours with Texas A&M, Galveston, other institutions here on the island, the chamber, just like Keith said, and, and with Christine and the ION and bringing that expertise to try to build our entrepreneurial ecosystem, which is really to try to help people see things that sometimes are right in front of them. They're just not used to recognizing it or seeing it. And and, and our mission is sort of to open their minds and help train them to think and, and see those opportunities that come uh, from all kinds of unexpected places. I love that. And, and we're already kind of venturing into my next question, which, you know, we keep saying this word partner or partnership or um, stakeholders. And David, we'll go to you for this. Tell us a little bit more about, you know, what makes a good partner? Um, and what's the role of partners in the work that you're doing? Absolutely. So so in, in my book, you know, partners means 
allowing for compliments. And, and the way you compliment is you find experts that are experts at different things and you allow them to do their expertise. Um, so for us, we look at it through four different pillars, right? We look at it through the uh, private sector. We look at it through the academia se sector. We look at it through the nonprofit sector and we look at it through the public sector. So the partnerships that need to be braided within those sectors are basically leveraging one another's strengths. So as a community development organization, we have certain strengths. We're able to ask questions from the community and bring in a community voice, unlike any other organization uh, in a region. When we think about the private sector, they have access to resources, right? So they are able to pull resources from different places, unlike any other industry. Um, when we think about the public sector, they have a very, very good job. They do a very good job of a systemic change. So they have systemic programs and programming um, public dollars that allow for systemic change. And then we look at academia, academia has a very nuanced role in actually credentialing people and training people. So a good partner allows for other experts to be themselves and do what they're good at. And then what's, what, what's needed then is a braiding of those different partnerships to allow for the, the greatest level of impact. I think, David, I'm going to sign you up to write the paper on what it means to be a partner. Everybody here knows I love P words for some reason, partnership, puns, programs, um, pop tarts and pitches is something we do in our Excel. I don't know what it is, but David, I'm gonna sign you up to write the paper because I don't think, I think if I take on one more P word, they're gonna say, you know, what, what's what's wrong with this here? So, I'm happy to help, I'm happy to help. Good, good, now that I've signed you up for that, let's go um, to Keith here to talk a little bit more about the partnerships and what makes a good partner? Sure, I'll, I'll stick with your P. You know, I think it's all about public private partnerships. And I, you know, I think that none of us can advance these missions, particularly around community development alone. Um, and for us, we really, really rely on and look to a yes and attitude. For us, that's a good partner. The issues that we're tackling are very challenging. Um, and innovation is not easy. So we're looking at those who are ready to tackle those hard issues that come with a yes first. They bring creative ideas to the table and they wanna fail forward together. Um, I think that none of us, you know, especially in Galveston, we have a tendency to um, react rather than respond to problems. And part of that is built into, we are dealing with disasters on a pretty consistent basis. Um, and so we're really looking at how can we plan forward and, and way further into the future and who wants to come around the table, generate ideas and figure out who has the right competencies. Because again, we live on an island, so a scarcity mentality is common. And what we're really trying to push forward with multiple agencies on the island is the pie is bigger, you know, those, those kind of adages about how we can all win together. So I think for us, it really hinges on a yes and attitude and those that are willing to take risks and fail forward. I love that. So now you're expanding my vocabulary from only the P words to the fail forward mindset, the yes and um, mindset. And so I'd love, Larry, we'll go to you just to, to weigh in a little bit here with how do you train kind of the students to be those partners that we need? Ooh, that's a great question, and I wish I knew the answer. I have some thoughts on it, nonetheless, <laughs> since I actually spend quite a bit of time working with students um, at the University of Texas Medical Branch. We're a healthcare profession school, so we only have graduate students. They're all in PhD trained, so they've already gone through a fair amount of thinking about what they might want to do with their lives, uh, and and so that's not a 18 year old fresh out of high school kind of student that has eyes wide open. You know, these people have already been through quite a few life experiences. And I think that it's not just about graduate students. It's about a lot of people in the community and around our environment who are not used to thinking about, I could do this. I could do that. I could say yes. Like Keith, just was alluding to. I could say yes, instead of going, well, you know, I've got, da, 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 I'm busy, I've got all these other responsibilities. Just say yes, and then go figure out what to do. I mean, and, and that's part of the entrepreneurial mindset as well of being open-minded and saying, you know, maybe I haven't done that. Maybe I don't even know what that means, but uh, tell me, I wanna learn more. I wanna explore myself. 
and open my mind. And so that's what I spend a lot of time with students. I've, I've become much more of a mentor and a counselor as my research career has gone on and my startup companies have come and sometimes gone. <laughs> and, and, and I think that that's just part of like, uh, that's just part of life of new opportunities and new ways of thinking and meeting all these yes people that Keith is just it, it finds all over the place. And it's such a wonderment to work with her. I love that. And I think, you know, on this panel, we certainly have three very strong yes and people. I think that's why we're here on this panel today. And so I'd love to switch gears a little bit because They've all, you know, we've all kind of had times when maybe we're the only yes and people in the room. And, you know, we, we all can kind of look back and say, oh, my goodness, I felt like the outlier or the only one with this mindset. So what would your advice be? And Keith, maybe we'll start with you this time. Um, what would your advice be for others that are really trying to get involved and get engaged in this work of, of really being a yes and person to create these sustainable cities and, and diverse, inclusive ecosystems? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. And I think, um, you know, my biggest advice, and again, this is the way we started, is to ask a lot of questions and ask questions within those communities rather than assuming what people want or need. And that these are basic tenets of engagement. But I think when you start from that perspective, especially in a place like Galveston or the Houston region, um, you know, I think it's really important because it puts that sense of ownership um, or shares that sense of ownership about the path forward. And I, I just, I can't say enough about letting people speak for their own community and their own voice. Um, you know, I think in Galveston, we've had a, a history or tendency in our planning processes or when we talk about resilience um, to include very few voices in that. And so that's my biggest advice. Just start, cast a broad net and ask a lot of questions and listen. You know, listening is critical. Um, that would be my biggest advice is, is really listen. I love that. And I want to now turn it to David because David has been such a change agent who sees everything through the lens of strategy, of listening, of asking questions, and of bringing people into the room so that they have the chance to ask questions. So David, we'll turn it over to you to, to comment on this question. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll just echo what Keith said. I mean, so from Baker Ripley's perspective, we've always operated from an appreciative uh, community building model, uh, which means that we are going in and asking about aspirations rather than asking about problems. I um, mean, what we try to do through that through that process is elicit from them what they are aspiring to do uh, and then take that information and build on what's working. So if my if I give any advice to anyone out there trying to do this work, don't build from broken, build from what's working, right? Find the strengths of the individual and use those strengths to, pu to uh, propel the individual, but also find strengths that are working within the communities. We go into some of these communities and there are a lot of challenges that are, uh, that are present, uh, but there are a lot of things that are really good about the communities. And if you can find those little nuggets of things where where you can leverage and, and build on, you have a better chance for success and a, a better chance for uptake for, 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 the, for whatever, excuse me, for whatever program that you are trying to build. I love that because David, you're also challenging us to take kind of an asset-based approach to the work that we're doing, right? Where, where no one is coming together and saying, well, look at all these limitations, look at all these deficits, or, or look at, we can never do this work. David, you're saying come in, identify the existing regional community assets and build from there. That's and exactly think, right. Yep. Uh, I think that mindset, you know, not only goes along with the yes and mindset, um, it also kind of flies in the face of, of a pretty um, interesting mental model, which is the mental model of a zero sum game, right? Which we're all used to just in our own respective careers you know, I win, you lose, right? You win, I lose. And that obviously equals out to a zero sum game. But I think something we're talking about here on this panel are the infinite mindsets. And so I'll go to Larry, we'll, we'll give him a chance to weigh in on this question too of advice for others. But Larry, talk to us a little bit about that mindset building that you're doing, especially with the students. 
I, I appreciate that uh, insight that, that everyone here has brought forth. And I think that the most important thing is to try to really listen, hear what people are saying, hear what their passion is, and try to take that and direct it and, and sort of empower them to act on it. So a lot of people go through their lives and they're sort of like, well, you know, I'm doing this, I've got this. And if you just say, wait a minute, you can actually do this other thing that you just told me about and you probably weren't even listening to yourself. And so a lot of it is reflecting what people say and what's, in, what's coming out of their hearts and their minds because that's where the energy is. That's where the power is for them to go forth with themselves. Because we only have a limited opportunity to actually interact with people. And it's what we empower them with that is the sustainability that this whole uh, <laughs> challenge uh, uh, number 11 is all about. And, and I think that's the sustainability part of, of getting people to listen to themselves and believe in themselves that they can really make a difference. I love that. And as you were talking, I was also reflecting on Keith's and David's comments. And I kind of thought, you know, I, I looked behind me a little bit. I said, you know, what if we just got everybody together in one room, in one space, in one city, and took that creative entrepreneurial potential in each individual and said, do you believe in yourself? I believe in you. Let's do this. Yes. I think that there's, there's, I think of chemistry reactions for some reason with activation energy, right? If you eliminate those activation energy barriers and you get people in the room talking and listening, th there is no cap on the innovation, the sustainability, the uh, growth, the systemic change that can be achieved. And so as we move now just to some of our final questions, I do want to open it up to our panelists. Is there anything else that we really haven't talked about that you feel has to be in this discussion? I see Keith leaning forward, so I don't know. Maybe she's got something. We can go to her first, but anybody can weigh in here. Yeah, I mean, I just, the only thing I would add to this is skin in the game, right? That everyone can participate and that there's ownership in your community. I think unfortunately we're fighting civic apathy where it's not even intentional but but many people that i talk to don't feel they're qualified or educated enough or know enough to get involved in the process and what we're trying to constantly you know invoke in people is this is your neighborhood this is your community and you have to show up and use your voice and a lot of that is also about what you just said, which is connecting in, right? We have to provide these opportunities for people to show up and feel encouraged to be involved. So I just, I think that that that's, you know, contextualizing that there is skin in the game for everyone around these issues of resilience and inclusion. And, um, I, you know, the more we can do that, um, the more we get our messaging clear on that, the better. Yeah, and I'll just say, you know, from my perspective, you know, there are a lot of good organizations out there doing great work. Um, you can find those organizations in whatever community that you're in and go in and support those organizations, whether that be through volunteerism, whether that be through providing some level of contribution. Um, and I, I would suggest to all the folks out there listening, it takes a, it takes a community to build a community, right? So it takes all four of those different sectors working together uh, to try to figure out the problems, uh, answers to problems that are very complicated and complex, uh, but that at the end have an impact on quality of life for individuals that are aspiring to do whatever it is they, they want to do in their in their lives. So find great great organizations and contribute the the best way you can, whether again through that's contrib uh, contributions or volunteerism. I totally believe in the volunteerism part. I I mean I I, I contribute as well, but volunteerism has a power that is kind of uh, almost agnostic in that it's just for the common good and and people get that and they think oh my gosh you know maybe i can do that and 
And I think that's the power of trying to engage people in, in their sustainability and their ability to contribute to the sustainability of their community and their own personal lives. I love this discussion. I love these comments. I wish we could talk forever, but I think what I would love to do now is just get that one or two word soundbite call to action for our viewers and, and for our listeners. Reflecting back on everything we've talked about, what's that one, I'll make it one sentence because I know we got a lot to say. So that one sentence call to action um, from all of our panelists. And David, we'll start with you. Yeah, I would say find an organization that you believe in their mission and support that organization. Excellent. We'll go to Keith. Yeah, I, just to follow up on the volunteerism piece, mine is commit to what you can, even if you only have five minutes, figure out how to use time as the most precious you know, resource that we have. So you can, even in five minutes, make an impact and make that impact individual empowerment, help people realize their value and their power in making a difference. So thank you all panelists, Larry, Keith, David, thank you so much for your insights. This is why I like moderating because I just get to hear what you say and then I say ditto. Uh, but in, in all um, reality here, it's been a great conversation I've listened a lot. I've heard a lot of questions being asked for our audience and those call to actions wherever you are in your entrepreneurial tech community building journey. I think we've all got little nuggets from this dialogue that we can take home to our own communities. Obviously, if you are in the Houston Galveston region, we would love to see you at any one of our institutions. So please do reach out and get in touch. Um, again, I would love to thank our panelists, Keith, David and Larry today. Uh, my name is Christine and I am Senior Director of Programs at the ION here in Houston, Texas. Thank you all for tuning in and see you all soon.